So speaking of that, and then going back to the topic of it being low code, I'm just going to ask Eric if he's there to please, would you give us a bit of a walkthrough as to how we did this in the workbench? So I'm not going to go into too much detail on all of the functionality and stuff. Anyone's interested, we could it's kind of a whole session on, on its own, but I'll just show it at, at a high level and go through the concepts. So like Jess said, we've set up three configurations for images, movies, and, and emotions. We go through one, say the emotions one. So this is after you've selected an image, how do we use the context? of that image and historical interaction that you've had with us to suggest some emotions that you might want to choose between in kind of this low code space. So the first thing that you actually do when you're setting these up is you create a project for it. So we have our kind of Adelo showcase recommenders project where we just link everything together and included in that is data on all of the emotions and images and movies that we want to recommend and any sort of priors that we want to give those. So those we can upload as CSV files here and ingest them into our recommender demo database. So you can see here's our showcase emotions, which will give us all of the emotions and images for the specific recommender configuration. I said, what are the typical columns of the CSV like that? Uh, features and so, well. so I think the columns, it kind of, it will depend on how much information you have available. So the, the simplest one would be the images one, because for that we're not, we decided to do that one is not using any context, so it's just doing images. So you can see all of that. The only thing that that actually has as its starting CSV is what are the names of the images. So obviously these are then referenced to the front end, like I'm not storing the actual image files here, but you can see these would be the names of the images. So that's the only thing the, our first step can do is put up re, a re, three random image. Initially, that the very first time it does something, that's what it does. Okay. Um, but as soon as people start interacting with it, all of that information is stored. So as every time the API is called and every time there's a successful interaction, there's another API call that stores that, and that's all stored in our logging database. We have this logging database that maybe mention the option store as well because the option store is continuously updated. Yeah. So so in the logging database we store every interaction in detail. So what was recommended what was it based on? What was the score for that recommendation? What was the data? There's a lot stored associated with that. What time of day it was, the minute, everything. And then there's a response collection in the logs that is stores all of the information associated with a successful interaction. So was that the movie or emotional image that you wanted to see? And that, like Jay said, is used to update the option store, which basically is a dynamic corpora about the likely effectiveness of each image. So the that initial list I showed you of the CSV with one column is the that's the data you used to do your initial setup. As soon as interactions start happening, there's a whole other data set that gets built out based on that using. But in theory, in addition to that, there is some prior knowledge about either the session, which would imply no knowledge, 
or the actual user if they were logged in. So in a real setting, you may be dealing with a known client and therefore you'd have a whole bunch of feature markers at the same time. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's, there's both dealing with a known client and also what we did for this one, so say for, for emotions associated with images, even if you don't have existing client interactions, you can have an educated guess at what you think is are going to be the most associated emotions. So you don't force it with rules to say this image, if they, if this image is selected, these emotions will be shown. But you say when it's starting out from nothing, just because of my sort of psychological knowledge, I'm speaking as just setting this up. I think these emotions are more likely to resonate with people selecting these images. And it doesn't mean it's never going to show the other ones or that if you're wrong, it won't learn that over time as it keeps showing the wrong stuff. But so you can both include prior information in the form of, as you say, existing context or historical data that you have about a person or in the form of like expert knowledge or business requirements or whatever you need to put in. Yeah, because I've been mean, just thinking in, a, in an academic research setting, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to administer some sort of standardized test beforehand. Sure. And like an EQ score or a, some other kind of uh, qualification of the demographic information. I think some of the thinking here is that if you think of the principle of any kind of standardized testing, it's completely statistically standardized based on a certain band of people. What we're saying here is that you shouldn't have to do that. Because if there are people that do not behave on that narrow band of what you decide most people behave on, you can still provide them with fairly unique interactions. And that's the difference here. So that means that Historically, what used to happen is we used to collect an enormous amount of data, run a statistical model against that, look at a certain standard deviation, pick a certain a group of items, group them together, come up with a test, make an assumption that all people from then on have to fit within that narrow band and implement it. Now what we're saying is that you could do both. Right? Take your standardized test and set up your initial engagement or interaction, or set up one that is cold start. It will learn dynamically based on the situation that you are in about all the nuances and how people behave over time so that you don't have a standardized view. You have got a human engagement view that then gives you insight into what people are actually doing. And I think that makes a big difference, we find, over time. Because now you don't have a classical problem with this. If you about historically machine learning, you take as much prior data as you can and run a batch job overnight, train a model on it, take the propensity, and you have a propensity-based model. But if you have a behavior-based model, you want to deal with variations in behavior. There's this classical example that I know Netflix, the guys, discussed a couple of times, and that was that if you make recommendations to, and let's say that you're dealing with an elder, there was an elderly female case. She was 75 or something, and she used to watch a certain set of series. Once a year, there was during October or somewhere around there or November, around the Thanksgiving sort of time, X Games, there was, and a whole lot of other activity during that period. And what normally would happen is the recommender, classical recommenders, will only converge on the norm of what people are normally watching. And it will not know that during that period, this person under certain conditions will watch something that's far removed from their base portfolio or their base profile. The concept is that when the grandson came to visit her, he watched X Games, and the grandmother loved watching it with him because they were sitting and talking and doing things. So when they ran dedicated social studies, they sent the social scientists to go interview these people one on one and ask him what happened. And they said, my grandson comes to visit. I decided to make dinner for us. He stays with me for two weeks or around that time because he's at the moment studying. And his parents passed away, and he lives with me during that period and then he watched X Games, and I like to watch it because he explained to me. And that means that every year, 
Uh -huh. Only during that period of time should it recommend something to do with X Games or Extreme Sport, but not at the time. So, so what happens? Yeah. The will have no idea of that, and that means that if you have standardized methods, you completely lose the nuance of time, place, and act. And what we're trying to figure out the whole time is that are there better ways to truly get to know that person's nuance, and then act on that, and then, but still take. Yes, like you're saying, still want to take that there are other things that they might be interested in. Yep. Sorry, I just thought it was just to give some context on that. No, definitely. Point as Jess was saying is to have the discussion just to go through. Yeah. But if you got any dynamic configuration, it might be worth just to show. I don't know if anybody wanted to see that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go back. But no, I just thought that there was no point in everyone staring at that screen while you were while you guys were talking stuff. So. Yeah, Okay, so once you've set up that data, then you need to configure this recommender. And that has a couple of steps. And the first step, you just describe it, give it a name, link that data we were talking about before. And then the next two, you said how it's going to behave and what fields in the data you've uploaded it should use. So in terms of how it's going to behave, you need to say what broad approach it should follow. So this is using uh, binary Thompson sampling, which is a multi on banded approach with a few kind of extra pieces of functionality built onto it. So there's three areas that you need to define. The first is kind of behavior over time and how much data it's used. So what you can set here is there's something called a cache, which we found is useful kind of if in practice you want someone to, once they've seen an option, you want them to continue seeing it for a period just for consistency. So it's maybe less relevant for movies, but what Jay was talking about before, menu items, you might not want someone's menu items to move around if they're not if they're logging again one second later, you might want to cache those for a day or a week. And you might actually want to do the same for movies as well, just to give people a bit of time to absorb what you're showing them rather than constantly cycling to new things. You can set that up here. And then you can say, how much historical data do you want to use in your this learning of this configuration? And you can set that either based on a time window or an account of interactions. And you can also link specific calendars to take into account kind of common human rituals. So what Jay was talking about, so for example, for October, 4th of July, you can specify in advance that those periods are going to be different. So rather than looking at yesterday, look at last 4th of July as an example. The next thing you can set up is how do interactions from this repeated interactions from the same person get taken into account. And that is something that kind of will depend on your, your application, but to kind of illustrate it, if I go in and I just, I'm one of those person who kind of compulsive, compulsively logs into apps and I go in and I end up seeing kind of the same image three times and accepting it each time. Or oh, it's a three is there, it's 10 times. So I see the same image 10 times and I accept it 10 times. Should each of those interactions count as much as Jess going in once and clicking on it once? I think that the answer to that depends on the application. I think often it shouldn't because you probably wanting to learn for the population, not necessarily and if you think of that population of two, you're now learning much more about me than about Jess. But there are cases where you might want to do that. So you can configure that here. Like, do you only take into account a certain number of interactions from each person? Do they become less important? So my first interaction counts as much as Jess's, but the next one counts half that, and the one after that, a quarter, et cetera, et cetera. So you can configure how that works. And then the last one is just set up how quickly you want your your learning to converge. So 
how much information do you think there is in each interaction? And how quickly should it narrow in on a specific option? And then in this step, you just said, you telling it the data you uploaded, what was labeling what was in the data you uploaded. So what was the name of the thing that you want to be recommended in the data set? So we wanting to recommend the emotion. We have some historical information in the form of the take up column. Context is the image column from this variable. And you can also, if you want to set this up to work, as I was saying, if you want to have it work per logged in user, you can set up that tracking key for a user here. And you can have an extra level of context. So the movie one, for example, has image and emotion here. And once you set that up, you click generate and it will create this option store, which is the list of all keeping track of all of the possible recommendations given the context and like, uh, information that we have about them. You can also view that in a graphical form if you want to. I won't go into that now for telegrams. He still has a bit of time. And basically, once you've set that up, you just need to deploy it. And I suppose you can actually, like if I've made a change to this, you can deploy that change while the, the cases or the predictor or recommender is live in production without any downtime or anything like that. So you set up your deployment and link that configuration that you created and tell it which environment you want to deploy to. And all you have to do is push and it will Once you get that little green message, it now is using the updated configuration to run in production. So that's yeah, how you that's how you set it up.